thank you for bringing us this morning to this service where we shall be learning Lord Jehovah to follow you and great secrets of the kingdom and that is why we've come here my father take this as one of the sacrifices from us oh God and Lord as we get started with this session how we call upon your presence to come and be with us I want each and every one of us to just go before the Lord in your own way talk to me tell him God I am here for you Jesus just talk to him this morning let him hear you pray let him hear you speaking to him yes the Lord, I want to be molded by you. I want to become your vessel, and not just a vessel, but a vessel of honor. I need you only, O oh God. Lord, come and use me. Come and teach me. Come and mold me, Jesus. This morning, Lord, I clear every issue in my spirit, in my heart, that can stand as a ground for the accuser of privilege to accuse me in any way in your presence. I repent it. And I ask you, King of kings and Lord of lords, by the power of your cleansing, mighty power, may you refine my life Refine me like the refiner's fire, oh God. All I need is you to speak to me this morning. Jesus, come and speak to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you shall begin to walk a journey with us. Even with every other person joining us in this message. We are releasing your blessings upon them, Jehovah, wherever they are. Jesus, we call upon you. We are committing and dedicating this service in your hands. We are dedicating this hall, this room, every seat, every corner in your hands, oh God. And therefore, we want to crush the work of the enemy and declare that the enemy will not conquer in the name of Jesus. That in the service today, oh God, we shall experience your goodness. We shall experience your dimensions of revelation and power in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. We can have our seats. So I welcome you today for this great service. It is the 23rd day of January. Actually, the 23rd day of the year 2023. And I believe this far, Jehovah has been faithful. And he's going to be faithful even the more. As we continue uh, to grow in his word and in his goodness. Hallelujah. Uh, remember, last Sunday I announced it and... I said that we'll be beginning these sessions in the morning, which will be starting at 8 to allow 9.30. And this is because God has put a burden in me that before the end of this year, there is a kind of a team, an army, that I need to have raised because of the preparation of what he wants to do with us. One thing I have learned about God is that if the right thing has not happened, God will not be in a hurry. Praise the Lord. God will not be in a hurry. If the right thing has not fallen in place, God believes more in rescuing and impacting many generations behind than just uh, achieving things that will not last. So, I believe when you see God beginning to cause us to prepare ourselves, it's because of something that He wants to do with us. And therefore, I want you to, to be very keen 
in what God will be speaking to us. Make sure you are taking notes. Uh, make sure you are recording those important points. Some of these things, uh, don't trust your mind so much that your mind will give you what you want and keep it for long. But you can note it down. And some of these things in future, in the coming years, I want to tell you, you will use them. You will use them. And God is going to use them as well as you minister to others. So I want to be, I, I shall be teaching about, there are many things concerning maturity, growth, understanding some secret things that uh, make God to use people. Secrets that attract God to use people in his work. Hallelujah. It is good to communicate the message of God. But I want to tell you, it takes time for God to trust somebody. So as a foundation today, I'll be teaching about the person that God will use. I'll begin with that foundation. The person that God will use. The person that God will use. It is true God can use anybody. But God will always have a reason as to why he will use a certain person. Why will God use me? There is one question that I think it was Apostle Peter. When Jesus told him, I think Jesus said something about the Holy Spirit. I don't have a, a reference for that, but if you have it, you can search for me. When Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come upon them, and they asked, how comes it will be upon us and not to the world? You know, to everybody. Because there are moments when God will only deal with specific people who have certain qualities. Hallelujah. So who is this person that God will use. I'm going to talk about the person that God will use. I don't want you to be very narrow and think about this must be a preacher only. The person that God will use is not necessarily an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher of the word. But I'm talking about somebody who will stand in his generation or in her generation. And God will use that person for his purposes in whatever dimension that will please him. So, as much as God is molding us to be great servants, the person that God will use, I'm sure God wants to use billionaires who will still represent him, who will still show fear, who will still recognize God, who will still cause many other people to believe that Billionaires must not be wicked people. We have billionaires who fear God. Hallelujah. God is looking for such people. God is looking for people who will lead nations. And they will attract record like King Hezekiah. That there was no other like him. You know, a man who feared God. A man who would pray and negotiate with God concerning death and God will stop death. There were God-fearing people who operated in many dimensions. How many demons did you hear that Job casted? How many sick people did you hear that Job prayed for and they received healing? Did you ever hear that Job at any given time went to raise the dead? But we know one thing for sure. The man went through hell and back. But he stood with the integrity of faith and the God that he knew. And the Bible says that towards his end, 
this guy was stoutly rich. Meaning, he is a symbol of men that can, God can use. You know, a symbol of men that God has preserved before. He used them. They ended very well, despite them going through hell and back. They waxed rich, and they still represented faith. They stood as men that God trusted. Even when their spouses were tempting them to come out of the will of God, they still stood. But do you know what? God prepared them. Hallelujah. So who is this person that God will use? And I want to say to first of all read the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. There are things that we learn there. I trust in God that he's going to give us the utterance of the time. He's going to give us the revelation broadly and widely. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to read from verses. Verses 11. Verses 11. There are so many things that we'll be learning here that will bring great revelations and understanding of many things that sometimes we've been erring, err, we've been walking in error. And I believe through that, God will perfect us and with the time, you and me will begin to realize that there is a way God has started trusting us. There is a way God has started dealing with us. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11, the word of the Lord says, no, let me say verses 10. Ephesians 4 verse 10. He that ascended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. Who is this person who ascended? Who ascended above all things? It is Jesus. Verses 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Now you see the first thing in the verses 10. Uh, verses 10. Uh, the Bible is talking to us about this mystery of Jesus. That he is the one who is glorified above every, above the heavens, he has filled all things. So there is nothing that came outside Christ. And why was he doing all this work? He was looking for the right people who will be his vessels, who will be entrusted, a mantle, a mandate that is expensive, that cannot be entrusted everyone. And verses 11 says, he gave some. Now, in verses 11, after he had covered everywhere, he started raising men. And he raised five offices, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers of the world, and pastors. Well, these people are like tools of work. And I always say this with them. The fivefold offices are the most superior offices that a believer can ever desire to be used of God operating for. Apostles are people who lay foundations and they begin to raise people based on those foundations. An apostle has the grace to operate as a teacher, as a prophet, as a pastor, as an evangelist because it is a heavy calling. And you need to understand that there are differences between offices and gifts. An office is an authority. An office is an institution. 
an office has power to discharge a lot of duties. So there is a gift and there is an office. So these are offices. When somebody is in the apostolic office, there are things that he doesn't need to start praying for, for them to happen. Why? That is an office. When our president is seated in state house, as the head of state, that is an office. And as a head of state, he can declare things without asking for opinions from people that he leads. You know, he is not a president because he is actually based at state house. He is a president by virtue of being elected and enrolled into that office constitutionally. Hallelujah. He has been enrolled in that office constitutionally. I'm trying to divide between an office and a gift. There are people that we see God using here. Remember, our title is the person that God will use. There are people we see operating gifts of prophecy, one of knowledge, and we end up calling them prophets. And some also end up calling themselves prophets. Yet they are not prophets. They are just operating a gift. And a gift cannot make you a prophet. A gift cannot make you an apostle. An office can. Hallelujah. Listen, there are people who can lead better than the sitting president, but they can't discharge that authority like the one that the president can discharge. Why? Because they have not been enthroned into that office. Look here. What makes our president to be a president is not because he is seated in the status. By the way, he can come and stop by the street here on Kenneth Matipa Road and say tomorrow it will be holiday. And that is it. Hallelujah. It will be holiday. Even if he speaks from a car, a moving car, he just speaks, takes a microphone, and this guy is just moving and saying, from tomorrow until Friday, it is a full week holiday. It shall become. The office is powerful. Hallelujah. So these fivefold are offices. And God has not stopped calling people into these offices. Prophet is an office. A prophetic office is an office that God also has used to lay foundations. Prophetic office has many functions as well. A prophet might not operate like a pastor. That grace, sometimes it doesn't work well with a prophet. A prophet can somehow operate better with some grace of evangelistic, but pastoral grace is not really uh, very much in a prophet. There are prophets who still manage to operate some teaching grace. But a prophet in the office is a man that God has endorsed and given power to also make decisions on behalf of God. Sometimes even in his own power he can make decisions and release those decisions to people. That is why you can see the prophets in the Bible. There are things they did not because God told them. But they just behaved according to their office. Hallelujah. Do you know it is not God who told Elijah to go to the mountain and contend there with the Bible prophets? No. Actually, even if you read it, you will not see that and he sensed in the spirit that he should go. No. You not even see like God spoke to him to go and no. He understands that his office, one of the things that his office should do is to defend the kingdom. 
to stand for the truth. And he knows, according to the mandate given him, that God will be in those decisions that he shall make. Praise the Lord. That is why an office is very powerful. There are decisions that I make without telling my wife. But I know if she finds me doing those things, as other people will be wondering why I'm doing that, she will become part of what I'm doing. She will not begin arguing like others because she is part of the decisions that I make. Praise the Lord. There are decisions she will make in my absence and she knows how about that is. That if I decide this, even if my husband is not aware, if he comes, he will rely on what I am doing. Because she is operating within her office, within her jurisdiction. So, a prophet has some privileges of sometimes deciding things and God will always back those things. Hallelujah. Now, you see, there are so many things. Remember when a ranger would say, if I be a man of God, let the fire come. Let the fire come from heaven and consume me. If I be a man of God, let the fire come. And even one time the apostles decided to call that fire. Actually, they referred to a ranger. They said, why don't we call the fire like a ranger? That that fire may consume these people. Meaning a writer is not a myth. That was a truth. If you see the apostles, these apostles had read those testimonies. They came, they walked with Jesus. They had read that there was once upon a time the prophets ahead of them who called the fire down. It is not God who told the writer to call down the fire. The man knew what he should do within his office. The big question is, what had these people done so that God had to trust them this much? And that is why our topic, the man that God shall use. Or the person that God shall use. It can be a woman and it can be a man. When I speak the man, I'm com comprising both he and she. Hallelujah. Because what to a mungu he injiri, he can reveal the reveal of God. So what to a power that I know? We to a move with an attack to me and what to work. Could a woman on the guy if we get some of the guy in the day? Now, be a could a what to a part of the guy if we get what a mesa? No, the poor mesa soon will be the poor woman's and a good toy. At a sasa soon will be the mess of me. So we in the mess of me is a. Na haitoki raisi. Sumu ya kiloho, haitokangi raisi. Spiritual poison takes a lot of time to come out of somebody. Because spiritual poison, it goes deep. It goes beyond your mindset. It goes beyond your soul. It affects you spiritually and it begins to affect other generations. Because you will perform according to what you have consumed. And that same thing you shall give to your children, your brothers, your sisters and all that. So, if the situation right now in our nation is not rectified, and this is not the head of state to rectify, I want to tell you, God is preparing people who will rise like another new generation. They can be existing. Not that they will be born. Those who are being born now, they are fighting a lot of poison. And it is risky for them. But God wants us to be very intentional now. To be very deliberate in the way we shall rise and let fight the mess that is happening in the churches and in many places. Hallelujah. 
And the way to rectify this is not even to point fingers and say this one is not doing the right thing. It is by you becoming the right vessel. Then let them run from the truth. Hallelujah. When we talk about the office of, a, of, an, of an evangelist, these are soul winners. But of course, all of us, the bottom line, we've been called to win souls. An evangelist will always cry for the souls. It's an office that will not rest until a soul comes to Christ. That's why I always give this challenge to the people in the evangelistic office. If every week nobody gives his or her life to Jesus, through your administration, then we are missing it. Something is not happening. All these offices, they carry a unique cry to discharge their duties. An evangelist would want to see hell depopulated and heaven populated. An evangelist would want to see a situation whereby people are discovering Jesus all the time at all costs. Whether it is through crusade, whether it is through one-on-one, -on -one, whether it is in a bus, traveling, in any place. I was watching a video the other day in an airplane where somebody stood up as the plane was about to dispatch and he said, hey guys, my fellow passengers, one special announcement. Jesus is Lord. And if you have not given your life to Jesus, even if this airplane does not take us to our destination and you crash, you'll go to hell. So it's better we know that we might not get to our destination, but at least we'll get to the destination of heaven. At least we'll make it to heaven in case we don't get where we are going. But I want to bring good news. We will get to our destination and we also get to heaven. And he spoke about the love of Jesus and he was saying, is there anyone who would want to give his life to Jesus? In about less than two minutes, by the time these other guys were coming to stop him, because he was making the trip religious, he had already prayed. And those who had given his life to Jesus, their lives to Jesus, had already done that because he had finished even the confession prayer. I said, wow, what an evangelist. Hallelujah. What an evangelist. A man who takes advantage. You know, he saw and he said that this one, this is a church that has come all of a sudden built up. There is no pain in it. No, no, I, there was no expense. These are people who should hear Jesus. Okay, listen. The other person is a teacher of the word. He's represented by this figure. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher. You know the work of a teacher is to reveal truth, teach in details, guide, make sure that there is transformation happening. Follow up. Coach, mentor, that is a teacher. Anybody who claims to be a teacher and does not have the grace to bear the mess in somebody until the person is fully mentored, then there is a problem. The person needs to pray for more grace to be a teacher. Hallelujah. And he says then lastly, a pastor. Sometimes people have mistaken a pastor with a compromiser. A pastor is somebody who suits, soothing, can take time to listen. A teacher will teach doctrine. It's a person who should be very diverse, very wide. A pastor is somebody who will take time to rectify people as well, enter into the lives of the sheep. Actually, we say this, a true shepherd, a true pastor, smells like a sheep. Hallelujah. A true evangelist smells like a fish. So today, if you are asked as a prophet because of the long foundations and the interpretations that have been brought, we will say it is the one who drives the biggest car. The man who is flying all over. I mean, those people who live in high-end places. 
Because it's like the money, how much you have, is what proves your calling. It's what proves your anointing. No. So these are offices. So first God establishes offices. Now listen. Actually that was not my main message. But I was just trying to define these offices just in case. Let me go to verses 12 of Ephesians chapter 4. Why are these people called? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, why God raises these fivefold ministries? Briefly, is because God wants to bring perfection. Perfection cannot be brought by any other office but the fivefold offices. And then the cry is this, verses 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that the hereafter be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie, wait in wait to deceive. This is what is happening now. There are so many doctrines that have attacked Christianity in our time. And they are coming like waves. They are carrying people. That is why it is possible to have people in church who are differing with the message that comes from God because they have been built differently through media by another doctrine that was presented to them. That is the reason as to why people have ended up carving up with items and they believe those items are representing the power of God throughout. So the, the prayer, the part of prayer, the position of prayer no longer functions in believers because there is something that we have valued and exalted above. We've carried it and we have seen that it's a point of contact. We have seen that it represents God. So, who is this person that God will use? Number one thing is if God will use you, you must be genuinely called, genuinely called by God into His work. Genuinely called. Sababu kuna watu wa mejiingiza. Even the Bible says kuna watu wa mejiingiza. You must be genuinely called. I'm going to submit the top chapter Yuda, Jude chapter one, verse four. I think that's something I'm going to say. Kwa maana kuna watu wa mejiingiza kwa siri, watu waliyo andikizwa zamani hukumu hi, makafi, wamadiliyo na yama ya mungu wetu kuwa ufasiki. Now, kumkana yeye aliye peke yake mola na bwana wetu Yesu Kristo. Kuna watu wamefanya nini? Watu wa Mungu. Kuna watu wamefanya nini? Wamejiingiza. That is Jude 1 verse 4. Is there anyone with an English one? Because I can't find it. Jude kama nitapata mahali Okay, we can pass. Jude one four. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained for this condemnation, and godly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Kuna watu wamefanya nini? 
wamejiingiza so it's not everybody who is genuine kuna watu wamejiingiza wamejiingiza kwa mwito wamejiingiza kwa kazi ya Mungu wamejiingiza kwa mambo mengi sana lakini Biblia inasema lakini ni wanafiki watu ambao waliyesapiwa hukumu you know they are destined for condemnation lakini wakati wamejiingiza kanisa halikujua Paulo inasema huyu ni mtume huyu ni nabii huyu ni pasta huyu ni evangelist huyu ni mwalimu wa neno anafundisha vizuri na ni watu waliojiingiza na ni wengi ni wengi Juda anasema kuna watu waliojiingiza Haleluya Ndio maana kuna resource zingine zipatikani kwa madhabahu zipatikani kanisani Why are we not giving solutions even believers kuna believers wamejiingiza sio upi peke yake they are believers waliojiingiza wamejiingiza kisiri wala sema wamejiingiza kwa siri they have come secretly unaware but these people have already been condemned but because the church is bright how are what wamejiingiza the discernment is no longer there and because people have run away from the genuine call of god they will not know that there are people here who are not moving the same direction as us now i'm in jesus so what is going to change things and bring revival in this nation it is when we genuinely experience that call of god in us hallelujah so experiencing that genuine call in your heart genuine one a genuine call usiwe ni wale ambao wamejiingiza ambao Juda anasema wameingia katika siri lakini uwe umebeba genuine call that you are worship you are coming to god you are walk with god is genuine Hallelujah. So that's one point you must be genuinely called. Genuinely called. Even here if you will have a difference in the church here let me tell you people mature differently. There are those who mature earlier than others. There are those who resist maturity and growth. But until we have a good number of people who are mature to influence the others it takes time for the church to get to a level of maturity we must have a number that is going to set the pace for others and you are that person praise the lord so you must be genuinely called of god <clears throat> genuinely called of god number two, you must understand your assignment understanding your assignment understanding your assignment if you read Ephesians chapter 4 verses 12 in asema for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ that is assignment that is assignment so if you don't understand your assignment even as a leader as somebody who wants to bring change and transformation not only in the church please don't just take it the church set up the Christ intervention ministry no even in your family even in your own life even from where you come from there are many battles that need to be fought and brought down there are battles that are fought our families and some of them died having given up 
They don't want even to talk about it. They are ready to fail. They were ready to fail and they were ready to see it defeating them. But who is this person who will stand up at this time and say, Stop? We must bring back the perfection of God's will in this family. It is that person who will understand his or her assignment. Hallelujah. As a believer, you have an assignment. I want to tell you, your assignment is not to attend service here in church only. This is not your main assignment. God is investing too much in you. Because he is believing that through you, as you become a resource in the kingdom, you will cause many to come into that perfect will of God in the perfection that God will want to see in his people. What is your impact? First, to yourself. Are you building yourself or you are destroying yourself? Because the first confidence that the people that you shall transform will come from the transformation that they will see from you. Hallelujah. So the first conviction that will make people believe you are God is not what you tell them that they can become but what they will first see and testify in your very own life so the second point is understanding the assignment the assignment is to stand as ambassadors of Christ ambassadors of God is to represent God on earth. As far as I'm looking for, I pray that God will help me to get it. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to read verses 14. It says, And if Christ be not listened then, but and if Christ be not listened, then this is our preaching vain or wordless. It has no impact. And your faith is also vain. You see what Paul is saying? If Christ is not risen, our preaching is useless. And even the faith that we are trying to introduce to you is also useless. Meaning, this is someone who had a very genuine calling. He understood his assignment first is to also experience that Resurrection power. Hallelujah. Experiencing the conviction about resurrection. Verses 15 says, Yeah, and we have found false witnesses of God. Hallelujah. Another version says, We are found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that raised Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says that if Christ is not risen, we will be misrepresenting. Now, my message is, my, I want to put weight on this statement. Misrepresenting. What is a misrepresentation? A misrepresentation is a false witness or a false testimony about something, especially if you have not known about that thing. Then you are testifying 
of something that you yourself are not sure about. So if we have to understand our assignment, we must also understand ourselves. We must be a testimony to what we are testifying to others. Hallelujah. Why sometimes you see church growing weak is because we've got believers who are waiting for the people who will come and get transformed. But we don't become that transformation. We don't put ourselves to become part of that transformation. And I want you to take it to, up to yourself that you are not waiting for another person to come. You are the person that will be transformed and get onto your assignment. Hallelujah. Otherwise, we will be found misrepresenting God. So, this word represent is very heavy. Represent meaning we, we are standing on behalf of I think there are moments you see our president invited in places but he sends the deputy. Depends with the kind of a meeting. Or maybe he can send the minister of foreign affairs. Now when that man goes, that nation, if they were supposed to receive the president of the Republic of Kenya, that is the respect and the honor that that man will be accorded. Why? He is coming to represent. Are we together? He's coming to represent the president. That man will be seated there because the time for the head of state, the president of the Republic of Kenya to speak, when he is called upon, that is the man who will start to represent him. Praise the Lord. Now, you see what Paul is saying here? That imagine if we are found misrepresenting God. So it means when you stand, you stand as a representation of Jehovah. I don't know whether you are getting this. And to give to Mesimama, to Nafa, to Nasimama, come on. One and one to another, Krishna, Nani? Move. There's a man of God who passed on, Reverend Harrison Ogo. Before he preached, he would come and stand and say, receive greetings from Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what he would say. Receive greetings from Jesus. And he would say, he has sent me here today to represent him. I am here on behalf of Jesus. And whatever he was supposed to do, if he was here physically, that is what I will do today. Hallelujah. That's how he used to introduce himself. Hallelujah. We understand our assignment is to represent this kingdom. It's to represent God. And a representative of the kingdom should be a person who should be honored out there. So expect to be that person that will cause people to honor God. Hallelujah. And this is where you even begin to reject the report of the enemy. And tell the enemy, you know what? I can't be representing God and I remain like this in my life. Those are some of the tips that give you authority to take certain positions in the spirit that give you a command to cause some things to happen. So you stand as a representative. You testify about the one that you have known. Praise the Lord. So that was point number two that we must understand our assignment. And our assignment, nobody else will do it, it is going to do it. The assignment is different depending with what we are doing. Here in church, there is that assignment that belongs to the church, to us, to you as a member, to you as somebody who is in any leadership, or who is aspiring to be a leader out there, not only in this church. 
you must understand your assignment. When I was in Nigeria, there is one lady that I asked why she did Bible school and she's not in any leadership capacity in the church. I asked her, why did you have, she has done a degree in chemical engineering and then she tells me, I also enrolled and did another sec my second degree in theology. And another one told me she, for her she did the school of ministry. There's another one who told me that she did the defensing of the faith, is it apologetics. So I was asking her, you are not a leader in the church. Why did you have to do all this? She told me, I first wanted to become a better Christian who understands the will of God from the Bible. I went to school fees for four years doing theology, not because you want to be a pastor, but your commitment to know God more and to know what you are supposed to be and what you are supposed to do as a believer. Even if you never become a pastor. <laughs> she wants to live a life that if people will see her, they will say, wow, that was a Christian. The way she carried her life, the way she demonstrated things, the way she discharged her duties and such, that, that sister was a Christian. Hallelujah. And then she told me the other thing. I want to be a productive follower of my pastor's vision. That was in Dunamis. I want to be an effective, an effective follower, a follower, a believer, a, a member of a church where I am productive. I am that productive member who can support well the vision of my pastor. There are some people who come in that church, in, they, will, they want to see a person who is tapping the issues of the spirit, praying, breaking before God. I'll be that person because I have learned how to do it. God has helped me to understand the kind of a God he has helped. I've been breaking before God. And when I do like this, it will be very easy for my pastor to do what God has called him to do. Hey. And that is when I understood why just a male member who has no recognition in Nigeria can come in Kenya and look like a whole apostle. If you go into a church that has 500 members, sit down there and you despise from the, their bishop to the usher. If it gets five minutes, the kind of a battle that man will experience in that church, they will say that he has come to overturn and not because he has come to overturn. He's just expressing the faith that he knows. He's a guy who understands his assignment as a believer. I ask myself, how many people in the congregations of Kenyan churches have done degree in theology, school of ministry? They have gone through Bible school, not because they want to become pastors, not because they want to become anything, but because they want to become better believers who will have impact in their time. Hallelujah. Is that not a challenge? Unfortunately, you find even pastors who have not been to any, any of those schools of this, but they are. When you when come to Kenya, you find those are the, 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 the big people we have. I'm not saying that it is Bible school that makes people to know God. But I want to tell you, those who have gone through that process, they can testify that something happens to you when you go through the process of uh, doing the school of ministry and Bible school and all that. You can never compare. If God has given you an opportunity to study some of these things, it's very important. So these are believers who have understood themselves as men and women on assignment to make they are ministry strong, effective, and a ministry of impact out there to the people. In Nigeria, they stopped coercing people to give tithes and offering. The message of tithes and offering is very minimal in Nigeria. Minimal. 
It doesn't work. How can it work when people have already worked on themselves? But in Kenya, we must threaten you. We must threaten you. You are a robber. And robbers will not go to heaven. The, the, the Bible says you have been cast with a curse. A curse has been used to curse you more. You know, because in Kenya, we don't use it that way. There is no offering, there is no time. There is no sacrificial giving. People must feel that hell is coming closer to them because they have not given. So they, wow, let me set myself with this 50 pop. You know? So, but I realize there is a gospel there that is not being taught in the church. They say that it is a waste of resource. We can't have all this time and all we'll tell you is an offering. When Boko Haram is using all manner of witchcraft and sorcery and weapons that are so cold, we should be thinking of how we can diffuse in the atmosphere, appear there, kill them, diffuse again, and find ourselves in Abuja. You know, they are thinking about things that can bring impact and bring God the glory. I saw a testimony of one Ami who was showing a bullet and he was telling Apostle Dr. Paul Energy, he had carried it. This bullet, if it touches 20 tons, it pushes 20 tons, 10 meters away. And he said, This is the same bullet that came and hit me and dropped down. Now, and they were saying before we went to the battle, you remember you called us here, you prayed for us, and he came with all his Muslim army, the other armies who are Muslims, and they were also there. And he was given anointing oil. And actually, it's the Muslims who are saying, you know, he used to come and anoint us before we get to the bush. Yeah. And nobody died in that thing. Nobody died, they all came back alive. So he was saying, how comes a bullet that can push 20 tons, 20 meters away, can hit my stomach and fall down? And I saw Apostle Elijah picking the bullet. He said, so this bullet came, hit you, and fell down. And it fell. You know, I was feeling like it is going to burst again. It might burst there. Do you have such testimonies in our church from just mere members? Why don't you become the first person who cause people here to believe God and fear God? Yes, because there are people here who must see a pattern for them to follow. They, they don't have a way of getting it. There must be people who will become a template so that others will find it easy to access that mighty, powerful God. But he that God is not revealed in you, Hallelujah. Understand your assignment. Become the pain setter. Because if we don't mature to that level, then there is a song we will sing here forever. My daughter Brielle will grow up and find us singing the same song. And she will think this is what we call gospel. Why don't we be raising the dead so that as so there is growing up, she will come and find that there is a God who raises the dead. Hallelujah. But a God, not a noisy pastor who is bringing people and pushing uh, people to do things that are very, very common. Okay. So, number one, we said it is a genuine call. Number two, we said. Uh, it is understanding your assignment. That was from Ephesians chapter 4. Understanding your assignment, we got that from verses, verses 12, that our work is to be used of God to perfect. Number three, if you become that person that God shall use, you must be stable in faith. Stop. 
stability in faith. There are people who fail all the time. They are not consistent. When we talk about stability in faith, we are talking about you are able to start and grow. And not just believing God for a miracle only. I'm talking about you are found following Christ as a worshiper from the beginning to the end, 10 years down the line. There are things that we will see you achieving in life and you will say this was a God-fearing person from the beginning. Hallelujah. Kuna mambo nimepitia na huwa ninasema hiyo shetani tu ilikuwa baadhi yake sababu usiku nimejua Mungu vile nimemtua leo but for now kuna mambo siwezi kuhusu ifanyike kwa maisha yangu kuna mambo siwezi kuhusu kufanya na maisha yangu kwa sababu nimeshamtambua Mungu na nimejua the way to do it right haleluya that is the stability we are talking about we must be stable in faith keeping faith to the end we are not compromising we are not losing hope we are not ready to give the devil an opportunity a very sad story of a very dear sister who passed on recently so when i heard the story of such that person i i just I heard that she she got so disappointed with life and after allowing that she lost trust with God and turned into depression so the next thing she did was taking poison but the time she was dying she was saying oh god forgive me for what I have done forgive that's what I heard she was telling that the people even the pastors who were praying for her God, I pray that you forgive me. What I've done is not right. If I die, if I will not survive, God, allow me to enter into a kingdom. You know? And so, this a person who was full of life. Towards the end, she has just decided to take away her life. You need to have staple faith. Staple faith is contributed by what Apostle is talking about in verses 13. The unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. The unity of faith. You cannot grow alone. You cannot lie alone. Unity of faith means fellowship. You must work with other believers. We are not that kind of a church that teaches people not to work with other churches. As long as they are churches with sound doctrine, we will work with them. And the other one says is about uh, the growing in the knowledge of Christ. That's how you become stable in faith. You must know Jesus, just like our our thing there in the book of Philippians 3:10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You must keep on discovering God all the time. Discover him through the word. Pass, having personal time to read the word. Please read books. Read Christian books. If you don't have a good book that you feel can build your faith, see me after the service. I have got very many good books. Over 60 books. Tell me which area of life you feel like you need to be built up. Is it the area of loyalty? Is it the area of growing in faith? Which area would you want? Do you want to learn how you can confront evil spirits and destroy them? I can help you with a book. And if you finish, I'll give you another one. Actually, I think I have about 70, 70 of them. That's how we grow, brethren. We don't grow by only reading sexual materials. It will take commitment. It will take commitment. You know? And that is why in verses 14, 
Apostle Paul is warning people about being children. That you will be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and the slate. That is the desistiveness of men. Eh? And the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If you see people being deceived, it's because their faith is not stable. And their faith is not stable because they have not invested in the knowledge of Christ. We can invest in a lot of things in our life. Please, make it your duty today. You can write it in that one somewhere. Let not a day end without you reading at least one chapter of the Bible. Make it discipline. Every day, make sure a chapter of the Bible you've read. Look for a book. Make it your duty. If not every week, if not after every two weeks, even if it's once per month, read a Christian book that can build your faith. And Christian material from a seasoned servant of God, something that is coming from men of God, men of faith, who can build you up. There are so many. If you don't know of any, please see me, I'll help you. And we will be doing an evaluation. Actually, one of the things we will say and put here as the rule says that if we didn't want to achieve what we want to achieve here, every man, each of us here, let us have a certain book that we are reading. Every man too, if possible. That we have read that we can say, thank you Mary. That I have read this, I have learned this. Let us see the track in three months time what we shall have become in faith. Hallelujah. Because there are things, brethren, that we will not continue being pushed when we are pushing other people who are very low in faith. I want you to consider yourself the reason as to why there will be revival in this church. There will be revival in this nation. There will be revival in Africa. There will be revival in the world. I want you to consider yourself to be the reason as to why God will find a vessel here to use. Hallelujah. Because God is raising you now. You are being raised into something else. God is raising you. You must begin to appreciate the process. God does not work with people that he has not one, called. Number two, that, that he has not processed. You must take them through a process. Number three, that he has not tested. Hallelujah. God does not work with people that he has not called. He has not processed and he has not tested. Let us become those vessels that will become the people that God has called, that God has processed, that God has tested. God will test you in many areas. He will test you even in the area of responsibilities, even personal responsibility. Personal, live about responsibility for others. Your very own life. Because some people are very irresponsible. Your own life, you are not responsible. Your very own life, live about the life of somebody else. You are not responsible. God will test you. When you feel like you are fully grown that you, are, you have it, He will test you. God will test you in the areas of faithfulness. When you think now you are faithful, He's going to bring a situation. We say that God does not tempt. Actually, even the Bible has rejected that. That if anyone is tempted, let him not say that he's being tempted by God. Because God does not tempt anyone. Are we together? Are we together? Let me get to that scripture.
James chapter 1, verses 13 and 16. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempted no man. But each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. Does God tempt anyone? No. And when somebody is tempted, the Bible is one is let that man just know that he's the one who has given himself into his own lust and he has been enticed. So God does not test anyone, attempt anyone. But God tests people. God tests people. When you know you can be very faithful, like let me use the area of giving because that is the area with greatest challenge with many believers. When you have little money, you can be very faithful. And God can, and a time comes when you feel like, ah, I am faithful. Then God blesses you with like two million. And you realize the tide is 200,000. He, and we are being here. Unaanza kuwa na negotiation tempo na mungu. Sababu hii mekua mimi. Lakiku wakati likuwa miambili. Twenty bob. Eh, hii hata naitua saa hii. Twenty bob kumatua haraka. Lakini vile inaendelea kufika. Twenty million. Sasa nataka kutua. Two million nilutua yukama. Two million. Hawa plot at Kimbo. Plot uzima hapa. Kamaki. Ni. Kaburu. Nitoe. He. Two million kwaza unangalia kwenu mahalu kutoka village. Unaona that is two acres. Wengine hapa ni three acres. Three acres! No. Hiyo inakua shida. Because the time of your testing has come. That is now God testing you. When you are being tempted. The devil is tempting you. And God is testing you. So where is the temptation? The money is too much. Can't give this one to God. That is temptation. And the devil speaking. Where is God testing? I've given you because you, you've been faithful. You've been a tithe, you've been a giver, you've sacrificed. And according to the book of Malachi, the windows of heaven have now opened up for you. So that the blessings will rain and you have no place to, to store them. Now that time you begin to negotiate. When you feel like you have really stood up in faith and there is nothing that can shake you, God will test you sometimes to reject something that according to you is very precious. He will test you. If you are working somewhere, it can cause your boss to misplace the money. Na unaona hii pesa hata ikipewa muda hii haikawa ijulikana kama ilikuwa. Hiyo ni test. Kabisa. Lakini unasikia wacha tunirudishe hata kama hawatanichukua na chochote. All right. So when somebody is tempted let him not say that it is God who is tempting me. So God will never work with somebody until he has called you processed it, taken it through the process and tested you. Somebody said even faith that is not tested cannot be drawn. Trusted. Even God. By the time he's coming to the level of trust, you must go through the level of testing. You must go through the level of process. And that is one time he took Jeremiah to the potter's house. And he was telling Jeremiah, I want you to be very keen. Look at what that man is doing. Look at it. And Jeremiah looked and he see how the potter was doing things. Sometimes when something is about to, to come out the way he wanted, the potter would destroy it and say, no, this is not what I wanted. 
Hallelujah. And uh, he would start again. Trying to shape it again. We call that process. Imagine if Jesus, when he took the 12 disciples, imagine if he would have started using them now, they, if they became apostles like that, with, without having gone through the process they went for three years. What kind of people who, who Christianity do you think we'll be having here? Imagine Apostle Judas being filled with the Holy Spirit and already a commissioned apostle today. Imagine if we see a good by a one. Now, if you have another pig out to Broco, why did they put our doctor Mapa and Mapa and all and just do it all? One has few as I. Oh, yes. Imagine Peter, Master Zaka's daughter, and Katawatu Navisu. Just imagine if Jesus did not take them through the process to understand what they have been hiding. Imagine a chat with him. Everybody here hiding something, and you won't be going to come. Hallelujah. Imagine Peter. Imagine having those kind of believers. Unapata kuchungaji. Vipi ni pasta leo. Lakini ni miwana ni kama yo stress imekua miki. Ni naruti na huku kukunyo hile mututo ni ikuwa na kunyo wa kafra sija wapoka. Mene salizo na nakunyo na kuwabia. Ay, pasi. Umepotea sana kwa nakunyo. Eh? Kanisa inaaripika. Imagine, because we have not been processed. <laughs> that is, if the disciples would not go through that process, we'd be having guys who are not ready for the job. These people had different issues. Imagine Dr. Luke, Luke, the great physician, as the Bible calls him. Come and power through the process. I do it. There is also another way that somebody can get healed without taking medicine. I can go a post or two of advice about Mapaya, Kunua, Kuroro Queen, E. Utakunua, Saint Teresi, E. Utakunua. Where would be the power of God? Jesus took them from all those backgrounds, but at the end of the day, took them through the process. He's the one who was calling them. They did not call themselves. That's why he started by saying, if you, the man that, the person that God used, God was called you and you respond. Number two, process. Number three, test you. It's a time you send them out. Don't carry anything. Go like that. And they came back excited. Wow, we've seen demons coming out of people. And Jesus was up and told them, no, that is good. That is going to happen forever, but just know that the best thing is to always be conscious of heaven. That your names remain in the Lamb's book of life. So the miracle is not what I called you for. This was not a destination. This is just part of the demonstration of the power that will be working with you as you continue with the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. So Jesus would test them. The process. Next Sunday, we will be able to go to chapter 6 of Acts, which I did not manage to read. And we will see how God helped the early church to get the right people to do the work of the ministry. So we will be able to read like two more points on that. And thank you so much for coming, I. Hallelujah.